All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the show. Um, it's been a little while since I've done an episode because uh, I've been guest uh, guest starring on other people's channels uh, for the, mostly for the last few weeks. Um, but uh, we are back because I could not resist getting Alexander joining us to talk about his new book. Um, so we have Alexander Cheshkiewicz. Yes, Alexander okay. Cheshkiewicz. Thank Cheshkiewicz. you, Ken, for having okay. me on. Yes. <laughs> you just prompted me on it, and I very quickly yeah, forgot. That's right. Okay, it's all good. Um, so Alexander has a, a fairly new book out, and um, it is called Deja Vu, Has Everything Already Been? Yeah. Yes. Um, fascinating book. And uh, so... I have uh, had the privilege to be able to spend a little bit of time with it. Um, but honestly, I'm going to need to read this book a couple of times, I think. There's a ton of information in mm -hmm. here. Yeah. Um, now, uh, I guess, first of all, maybe just give us a bit of a rundown on what the book is about. Yes, my book is about lost civilizations and my focus was to just take all of the information I can about lost civilization and put it in one book, including the technologies, the alternative uh, theories, uh, the catastrophism and many, many information, as you mentioned, because I wanted uh, the reader to have all of the information possible. Of course, I couldn't include everything, but I wanted to include as much as I could into this book just to understand holistically the picture, the question of lost civilizations, because I found by reading many books about lost civilizations that plenty of authors were including some information in one book, some information in the other. And of course, the skeptics often dismiss this information because it was very fragmented. And yeah. I wanted to show that it isn't just like here's some information and here's some theory about lost civilizations but that there is a bigger picture when it comes to the lost civilizations and prehistorical catastrophes right so um obviously uh you you've obviously read a lot of books and probably watched a lot of uh, films and whatnot as well um what are some of the kind of outstanding um books in your opinion that that cover some of this information um in terms of what were uh valuable resources for you when putting this together yes i think that graham hancock is has very large repertoire of books but again uh, he has many books and sometimes they exclude some information between each other so mm -hmm. for the beginner it can be hard and so i think graham hancock is a good resource of course he has some mistakes like many of us we aren't perfect uh, but also some authors uh, who wrote about catastrophes. For instance, there is a, a very, very detailed book about the Younger Dryas catastrophe, let's say, a Cataclysm 9600 BC by Alan and Dela. It isn't that popular like Hancock, but it is a great vault of information and the history of both lost civilizations and uh, the history history of catastrophism and geology, which can really help us understand the conditions on Earth in the very distant past. So I would recommend Hankook and Cataclysm 9600 BC by Alan and Delay. Okay, awesome. Um, and I'll, I'll try to have some links down below. I know uh, Graham Hancock is pretty easy to find. Um, he's actually on Netflix now even um, with a, a really fantastic special uh, on that and um, but yeah some of this information you do have to get uh, kind of do a little bit of digging um, and I guess um, like for me I'm sort of a fan of the idea of, of ancient civilizations but um, maybe some of my viewers uh, might be new to the idea and so I guess one question would be why do we think that there that there probably was uh, or for sure was, depending on uh, what, you know, what your opinion. Um, in my opinion, it seems pretty dang sure 
Um, but you know, some of the uh, some of the evidence is um, uh, well. I would say the evidence is compelling, but is it proof? Well, that depends on your your definition mm -hmm. of proof. Yes, I think, yes, of course. Um, so, so why, in your opinion, why do you think that there has to have been some kind of advanced civilization? Yes, I started all of my research and writing my book with the question because I've been very interested in history, mostly the ancient one. But I thought, why the first civilizations appeared, let's say, 3,000, 100 years BC, plus minus uh, some couple of hundreds of years. And humans, anatomically modern humans like we, with just some slight discrepancies, but capable of rational thinking, of creating those ideas and of having these higher emotions like love, compassion, etc. Uh, humans like us existed on Earth for about 200,000 years. So the first question I've asked myself was, why our history appeared let's say so recently 3000 let's say plus minus 3000 years bc and here we've got human history ranging through 200,000 years so i thought hmm what was before those first civilizations and of course i went into prehistory and looking at the picture holistically we see that there is 200,000 years of human existence and then we've got 95 percent of this existence just you know there nothing happened we've got hunter gatherers uh, stone tools etc almost nothing happened for 95 percent of our existence and then there is this neolithic revolution 10,000 years bc and then there is another huge gap between the neolithic revolution 10,000 years bc and the first civilizations let's say 3,100 years bc so i found two huge gaps in which according to the present view the mainstream history and archaeology nothing happened there were some let's say upgrades in the tools stone tools but nothing big happened and there was no civilization etc so i thought what could have happened for all those years let's say an 190,000 uh, 190,000 years, mm -hmm. what happened during this lost history? And then I started digging and digging into those myths, legends and stories of lost civilizations. And I found out that according to our ancestors, who were closer to those very ancient times, there were, there had been before them, plenty of civilizations, plenty of cities, and there was culture. Yeah, so according to the sort of the mainstream accepted academic um, status quo, you know, we know about Romans and Greeks and before that there was Egyptians and they've all been this sort of steady growth. Uh, then, um, you know, uh, maybe about a hundred years ago, uh, we started realizing that there was actually stuff going on in Mesopotamia mm -hmm. uh, far be before that. And so that kind of pushed the, the, the idea of civilized humans back yes. in about 5,000 years. Um, so, uh, you know, around 3000 BC, uh, plus the 2000 that we're on this side mm -hmm. of is 5,000 years ago. Um, what happened like in the last 10 years that uh, was, was there a find that pushed that 5,000 year date back another 5,000 to around 10,000? What were the uh, what was it that, that suddenly just kind of threw a wrench into the whole idea? Yes, it was, for instance, the Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, but also in Turkey there has been found many other sites like Karahan Tepe, etc. And of course, according to mainstream still, it is no proof of lost civilizations, but in Gobekli Tepe we've got plenty of megalithic constructions, weighing some pillars, uh, weighing some, let's say, 5 to even 15 tons. <coughs> so these are huge boulders, huge constructions, and it is like Stonehenge, but many circles circular patterns of megaliths and it's and it actually dated our let's say origins of first settlements not civilizations to about let's say nine to ten thousand years bc so it really it really took this history back but still archaeology says that these were just 
advanced hunter gatherers and advanced settlements, but it was no civilization. But I think that if it was possible to build such megaliths uh, so long ago, why should we deny the existence of lost civilization, like for instance, mm -hmm. Atlantis or many other mentions? Yeah, well, the, so the interesting couple of things about Gobekli Tepe um, is it's not just stones that were that were stood on end. Uh, it's big stones that were carved um, and then that were uh, further carved artistically so mm -hmm. that there are um, a, a lot, uh, like they're kind of practically covered with, uh, with pictures of animals and of other things that some of them we have not yet identified, mm -hmm. uh, but all kinds of symbol symbology and artwork um, that is not only just inscribed into the uh, the stones, like it's not just scratched on, if you will, with a mm -hmm, with a rock. Of course. They're actually uh, the art is sticking out. So they mm -hmm. actually took the rest of the stone that wasn't the art has been chiseled down, um, and usually substantially, like at least a half an inch. Um, so we're talking about a, a enormous amount of work that went into creating this artwork. Um, in my opinion, that means that somebody was paying for a full-time artist. And mm -hmm. that, that means that there was somebody who had uh, consolidated um, wealth and power yes. and was able to make these kinds of monumental projects happen. Um, that certainly is not in keeping with a hunter-gatherer society. Mm -hmm. uh, and to me, that says civilization no matter what. Yeah. Um, and, you know, some people will say, well, it's not civilization because there's no writing, uh, but we don't know if they had writing or not. Mm -hmm. um, just because there isn't writing on the stone doesn't mean that they didn't have writing. Um, I also found, found it sort of interesting um, that, uh, you know, we have, we've only barely scratched the surface of what is at Gobekli mm -hmm. Tepe. Uh, they're they're yes. now finding other sites nearby that are um, mm -hmm. probably even older, but the Gobekli Tepe itself, that that very site, is essentially a huge mound, like almost mm -hmm. a mountain, um, that is basically made entirely out of um, stones that were placed there uh, purposefully, um, because uh, it, it appears that the entire site was buried intentionally, mm -hmm. yes. um, probably by uh, a huge amount of people carrying boulders up the up this hill and, and placing them there. Um, so really the hill, there's probably a natural hill underneath it, uh, but all we've found so far is just this giant pile of rubble that was placed mm -hmm. there. Um, not to mention the fact that um, underneath this rubble, uh, well, like we've only ex excavated a tiny, a piece mm -hmm. of what yes, we think yes. is there. Um, I don't know if they have done x-rays or LIDAR or w what it is as far as how they know the full extent of the site that hasn't been unburied. Yes, it's um, huge beneath. Yeah, it. it's huge. Um, my, I think that, uh, you know, maybe the part that we've uncovered is the, is the la was the last part to get uh, buried, uh, mm -hmm. but maybe it yes. wasn't. I mean, who knows? We've, we've got a good solid date tied to that part, uh, but we don't know if the rest of the site is, um, was in use at the same time, or if perhaps it was a whole bunch of, um, basically like a, a whole series of sites that was chronologically uh, adapted and then um, abandoned and, and a new one built, and then that one abandoned and a new one built. Um, and there seems to be a good reason for that in terms of the astro astrological alignments uh, that we see at the site. Um, like, I think it's almost like a calendar. And you know how every year we go out and we buy a new calendar because the last year's one doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think that these early civilizations uh, had, a, had a similar process where they were basically building... You know, we could call it a temple. It's not, I don't see any evidence that it's a religious, um, mm -hmm. yes. you know, thing. Uh, but whatever it is, um, it has, does seem to have some kind of ceremonial purpose. Um, 
in terms of knowing the the dates and times. Mm -hmm. um, and so to me, it makes a lot of sense that um, there was probably a civilization there for an extended period, and they probably had all kinds of uh, chronological iterations of this architecture, whatever it, mm -hmm. whatever they were using it for. And then they would bury it and build a new one, or perhaps build a new one first and then bury the old one. Um, I could just see, uh, like, um, let's say there's a million people who live in the in the area around there, and they were supposed to come here for summer solstice or something. I'm making this up, but it seems mm -hmm. feasible to me um, that everyone who would come would meet at this certain time of year and they would all bring a couple of stones in their backpack. When they got there, they would all drop it on last year's uh, area, and, and then they'd come to the new area for, for tonight's ceremony or whatever. Like, um, That's the only way I can think of that that many boulders were transported to that place. Yes, I think it is very probable because as archaeologists has found and are still finding, uh, the more we dig the Gobekli Tepe, the older the dates are. So it seems, and there are even some discrepancies by 500 to 1000 years between mm. some enclosures. So it seems that it wasn't even, I think, or who knows what we uncover later, but maybe it was that one site, one enclosure was still in use for, let's say, 50, 100 or more years, and then it was buried. Who knows? Right. Because maybe of the procession of the equinoxes, like one degree of the procession on the horizon changes every 72 years. So maybe they've actually saw that and they wanted a new one, a new enclosure to be more accurate. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if they're using high precision in their alignments, um, mm -hmm. that's just going to make them to go out of alignment uh, mm -hmm. quicker. Um, and, and I think that that seems to be what was going on there. Otherwise, why would there be so many different uh, parts that mm -hmm. seem to be uh, the same type of enclosure? Mm -hmm. um, uh, let's move on to, um, I guess, in, in your opinion, what was the, um, well, actually, no, in, instead of that, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you about Zep Tepe. Was that even in your book? I can't remember. Yes, it was, okay. but it was just mentioned briefly. And in the future, I want to extend it because, you know, Zep Tepe is the first time and it is both symbolic in the cosmological terms. It was the first time uh, during which everything appeared when the gods came down and the like mat matter even formed. So it has double the meaning. One meaning is cosmological in the creation of the world and the other is for the first time the literal translation which happened about 10,500 years BC during which uh, the gods uh, came to earth so it is very interesting that we've got double meaning in this one concept and plenty of people think that and connect like Graham Hancock Zeptepi with Atlantis and with lost civilizations because you know 10,500 years BC is similar for instance to the Orion correlation theory which states that the pyramids are aligned to the Orion as it was 10,500 years BC so we've got the connection here we've got the connection with this newly discovered Gobekli Tepe so again pushing the history really back we've got here in Egypt Zep Tepe but we've also got plenty of other even more precise mentions uh, in Egypt about those very very distant times for instance in the Edfu text there is a mention of something very very, very similar to Atlantis of an island of flame and from this island the god the gods came to Egypt because it, it was during the catastrophe that gods were being evacuated and they went to Egypt and again uh, the dates are very similar to Zeptepi and are correlated also we've got for instance in the king's list from Egypt three main king's lists 
on which the the modern actually Egyptology is based on those lists of different dynasties are very accurate actually like let's say in 80% there are accurate representation of certain dynasties and modern Egyptology just cuts off everyone before Namer or Menes 3100 years BC which was the beginning the unification of lower and upper Egypt but in all of the three main texts in the Palermo stone in the Manet those kings lists and in the Turin's canon we've got mentions of history going back several actually tens of thousands of years to let's say about 30 or 39,000 years BC so it is not only Zeptepi that is pushing our history really really back right so we're now talking about 40,000 years of recorded history mm -hmm. um and that aligns somewhat closely to the Sumerian kings list mm -hmm. as well, um, as well as some of the uh, Aztec or Mayan or Incan or mm -hmm. uh, Olmec or whatever, whatever, uh, whoever the people were who invented that, um, the, the calendar of South America and Mesoamerica, which is really still in use today. Um, I was just down in Mexico and, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's not, uh, it's not something that everybody is into, but um, many of the uh, the people are honoring their their ancient ancestry and are still interested in using and understanding these ancient ancient uh, calendar tools. Mm -hmm. um, have you been able to cross reference at all between the the various kings lists or those other chronologies? Uh, I wasn't that deep into it because in this book I've just wanted to connect all the dots and to show that it is possible for the existence of those lost civilizations because as i mentioned at the beginning i first started uh, when humans appeared and if if humanity appeared about 200,000 years ago bc it is very close actually because 200,000 so let's say that this king's lists of 39 or 40,000 years bc are still possible that right. there was some kind of smaller maybe civilization it is still possible during the 200,000 years of human existence. The same sure. with the Mesopotamian myths. They actually go back a little bit uh, deeper than 200,000 years BC, but there is at some point mention of creation of mankind. So who knows if really men appear 200,000 of years and these Sumerian chronologies actually uh, talk about some different beings, who knows? And mm, I found right. As you mentioned all over the world that we think that our civilization appeared let's say 3000 years bc or this neolithic revolution appeared 10,000 years bc but almost all of our ancestors almost all of these civilizations that we consider the first like ancient egypt like mesopotamia like ancient sumeria like ancient india we've got plenty of different stories in india about civilizations before last ice age about different Different, different periods of time which are very very long ago the same as you mentioned with Mesoamerica here we are that the Aztecs came from Aztlan or in Mayan codices we've got mentions of uh, civilizations for instance the Mu uh, from at least 8,000 years BC. So I was very interested at that because we think that our civilization just appeared 3,000 years BC, but all of these cultures, almost all, literally, it isn't uh, just some pseudoscience and just, you know, fake texts, but it, these are real texts which, ha which have some validity, like with the Egyptian kings list. All of these people, these first civilizations are talking about much, much older roots of our civilization civilization mm -hmm. yeah um it's one thing i find really fascinating about egypt in particular is that um nowhere in now correct me if i'm wrong but mm -hmm. uh in in my research um i have never seen a single hieroglyph uh that that shows a pyramid or a word that might mean pyramid um mm -hmm. you know there's also the fact that yes. no uh -huh. bodies were discovered in inside any mm -hmm. pyramids uh, mm -hmm. which you know many many people believe that that is uh that pyramids were mm -hmm. um, tombs there are lots of tombs in egypt but they're not in the pyramids um mm -hmm. so 
so I almost wonder if the you know the pyramids were were there, um, and perhaps there was already a taboo uh, that they weren't allowed to talk about them for mm -hmm. whatever reason. I mean, who knows? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's very interesting. Uh, for instance, Zakaria Sitchin was mentioning on the Narmer Palette, and we've mentioned that Narmer was the first king that unified Upper and Lower Egypt. And actually, on the Narmer Palette, we've got like besides the Nama, like some triangles that according okay. to Sitchin, but in my opinion, it is a little bit uh, over interpretation, but according to Sitchin, these triangles were actually the pyramids and Sitchin claimed that it, meant, it means that the Giza pyramids were before Narma. It is of course possible, but it is just a single piece. And I think that we should have more evidence for that. And it's yeah. very interesting because when it comes to the pyramids, for instance, the Great Pyramid of Giza was called the Akhet Khufu, the Horizon of Khufu, right? So does it mean that it was really the pyramid, the, let's say, burial site of Khufu? In my book, I show plenty of, in my opinion, silly evidence for the these three exactly Giza pyramids to be tombs of the Farios. Uh, but when it comes to this Great Pyramid, uh, there appeared recently uh, some evidence that from the uh, from the limestone quarry that it was mentioned that that they are transporting limestone blocks or granite blocks to actual place the Akhet Khufu, but you know Egyptologists claim that it is the evidence, but there was no mention that they were taking these blocks to build a pyramid or that they were taking it, you know, for the pyramid. You know, Akhet Khufu could be just a place. So the pyramids, even in the modern Egyptology, are still mystery. The most, yeah. uh, the Giza pyramids. Yeah, I, th I think there's still a lot of work to do. And mm -hmm. th there seems to be this idea that we know everything about Egypt. Well, uh, I mean, there are lots of people who like to think they know everything about Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, you know, the classic example of that is, um, of course, Zahi, Zahi Hawass, who um, a few years ago, uh, I have a quote of him from a newspaper where he says, uh, there is nothing left to discover on the Giza Plateau. Everything that, that has been there has already been found. Um, two years after he said that, he made uh, uh, another newspaper headlines when he claimed that he discovered a new city on the Giza Plateau. So, like, he proves himself wrong, um, and I think it's hilarious. But, uh, yes. you know, there's there's all these uh, these guys who are really just pretending that they know it all, um, and all they're doing is getting in the way of any further research and further progress. Yes, um, it shows how is, uh, how is this inconsistency, because you quote that there is nothing left to discover. And I quote in my book him that there is about 70 to 80 percent things that are still undiscovered under the sand in Egypt <laughs> to actually be discovered. So it shows his inconsistency. Yeah, definitely. Um, OK, let's talk about um, Atlantis. Mm -hmm. So. It, you know, a, a lot of times um, Atlantis is one of the kind of um, topics that gets ridiculed maybe more <laughs> than any other topic. Um, wh how do we, how did, where did the idea of Atlantis originate from? Yes, so of course, according to the mainstream history and philosophy from Plato's two dialogues, mostly for, from Critias, in which uh, Plato describes the Atlantis and finishes the dialogue unfinished, because there is like, uh, the end of the dialogue is cut out, we do not know if it wasn't preserved or if it was if Plato did it on purpose, just cut off the dialogue at the end, and of course from the Timaeus, but mo 
mostly from Critias. And in Timaeus there are some mentions and there are some very valuable and specific mentions, but mostly from Critias. And it's interesting right. because we find that there was this Atlantis story, this Atlantis myth before actually Plato. And I've been speaking recently with my author friend Michael Leflem, author of Visions of Atlantis, and he as a historian found a found some references uh, from about 100 to 150 years before Plato, uh, which mentioned the Atlantis even by name. So mm. it isn't that Plato just just made made up this story and right. of course we may say that plato was taking in inspiration from these older stories but these but this myth let's say of atlantis was present before plato and then plato says that it was taken from egypt uh, from actually from Egypt, from the Temple of Size to Solon, and Solon gave it to uh, Plato's family. So it is a very, very long uh, story. But yeah. actually, as I mentioned, even in Egypt, we find some mentions that may prove that this history of Atlantis was present there. And it isn't actually only Plato. Yeah. And so, I mean, if, let's, you know, Plato was certainly instrumental. So I just want to look at Plato himself. Plato was a philosopher. Uh, Plato was a scientist, a mathematician. Um, he was not, in, as far as I'm aware, a fiction writer. Um, I, mm -hmm. I don't believe that Plato wrote novels. Um, like Plato's, some of Plato's dialogues are allegories, but but many of them are based on facts. So we cannot like conclude that he didn't include anything from fiction or uh, from some morals, etc., or some of his values. But I think that from the dialogues I've read, most of them were based on fact. Okay. Interesting. And then. Um... So from so, but you mentioned that in Egypt there was a previous mention. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, so I found I haven't included in in my book Deja Vu, but I am researching it now, and I want in my future book uh, to include plenty of more references about lost civilizations, because Plato tells us that this tale of lost civilization was handed uh, to Solon, a Greek lawmaker, a very very let's say esteemed person in Greece. Mm -hmm. uh, so Solon went to Egypt, to the city of size which is actually one of the most ancient cities in Egypt and from there he gathered the information the story about the lost civilization of Atlantis that was about 9000 years before him so let's say plus minus 9600 years BC and actually in Egypt not only do we have mentions of this Zeptepi which is 10500 years BC which is also very similar let's say just a thousand years of uh, of difference but also we've got for instance the Edfu text and not all of the Edfu text has been translated yet so it is a real shame but some were translated and in these Edfu texts we've got mention of the isle the island of fire of flame or of reeds and also in Egypt we've got this mention and from this let's say island the gods came and then we've got in Mesoamerica mention also of the island of fire that was somewhere on the Atlantic Ocean and that was also connected with reeds. So we've got the theme of reeds in Egypt in these Edfu texts and of the island connected to fire to flame and the same story can be found in Mesoamerica. Also there is an island on the in this case on the Atlantic specifically but here we've got also the mention of fire flame and reeds. So we've got those mentions and I think that this Edfu text may point to this story of Atlantis and it may be another recollection like uh, that from Solon. Right. Um, that's very interesting, especially mm -hmm. the, the inclusion of reeds, uh, mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, in Egypt, Egyptian technology, um, reeds were used to create papyrus, mm -hmm. which was the Egyptian version of paper. Um, now it's not exactly like the paper that we uh, that we know of, but uh, mm -hmm. basically it's uh, kind of similar, um, sort of in between our paper and maybe something that would 
be made out of bamboo or something like that. Um, so it's very interesting that they would that they would go out of their way to call it an island of reeds um, when perhaps reeds is a way of um, symbolically or or maybe that's mm -hmm. just what they yes. called it uh, like the island of paper which would be sort of the same as us saying the land of books or you know mm -hmm. a, 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 a place yes. where they have yes. a lot of information um, so they might actually simply be referring to the fact that there was a lot of knowledge stored there. Uh, it, it could be something similar to the museum or the Library of Alexandria, mm -hmm. which was, of course, a, a big deal in, in ancient Egypt uh, until it was destroyed, which is kind of a whole other discussion. Um, but yeah, this whole... so that kind of gives us the idea of lost knowledge. So when they're saying that people came... Uh, from a faraway land where apparently they had knowledge and yet that knowledge seems to have been lost uh, in large part on the journey. Um, it also brings me several questions about the journey itself, um, spe specifically because there's an island involved. That means that they would have had to presumably use some kind of ship uh, to make that journey. So again, according to the mainstream, um, the, the first, uh, seafaring people were the Phoenicians. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think it's kind of becoming pretty obvious now that that's not the case. Um, Graham Hancock did a lot of work on kind of some, a lot of the evidence mm -hmm. there. Um, but there's all kinds of, um, other evidence coming from, uh, from, of all places coming from biology uh, because biologists are now really digging into human genome and mm -hmm. tracing the records of migration uh, of, of, of humans. And they're looking at, you know, uh, 10,000, 50,000, even a hundred thousand years ago um, where they're, they're able to determine uh, how the, how the human genes have moved around the planet. And uh, basically, they're coming to the conclusion that, well, these trans the transportation of, of people or the migration of people um, happened on a global scale uh, a long time ago, and they would have required uh, seafaring um, unless people were really good swimmers uh, <laughs> because there's, um, there's just so much evidence of of that kind of thing happening that um, I think it's pretty obvious that the Phoenicians were not the first people with a Navy or with uh, sea with seafaring capability. Mm -hmm. um, it is interesting though, that uh, so Z Zep Tepe also was supposed to be an Island, I believe, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. As was I think Atlantis. That the Zep Tepe was just broadly speaking the first time, maybe most likely the first civilization when the gods came the first culture, most like that. I don't know if it was okay. actually a uh, an island. Maybe not a specific place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. Is uh, what have we so far not talked about uh, that that you want to touch on from your book? Uh, I think that it is interesting because as my journey began with those 200,000 of years of lost history, actually of 95% of nothing, of no progress in human history or in prehistory, then I wanted to find out if there are mostly mentions of an island that was lost, if there are plenty of mentions about the Great Flood, etc. Is it possible that it was really the case that there were global floodings at some point in our history and actually we've got the end of the last ice age exactly uh, during plus minus the time of the plato's atlantis we've got the younger dryas during which uh, the temperatures suddenly actually was the ice age and then these uh, temperatures are 
you know, very low actually, and they are coming even lower. And after the Younger Dryas, they are skyrocketing to the end of the last Ice Age, to the total melting of most of the glaciers at that time. So it is very interesting that something happened during the end of the last Ice Age that actually decreased for some time the temperatures, and then these temperature, temperatures skyrocketed. And there are plenty of theories like the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. There are plenty of alternatives like like, for instance, the outburst from the center of our galaxy, even like the very intensive solar flare, etc. There are plenty of theories, but something truly catastrophic happened at the end of the last ice age. And since the end of the last ice age, all over the world, they actually sank a total area of 25 million square kilometers, which is more than North America. So I thought. If it was so, why couldn't a civilization like Plato's Atlantis, which was like Libya and Asia Minor put together, so it wasn't like the continent, it was like a massive island, let's say. So why if such a big area of land sank during this time, why couldn't the Atlantis exists at that time and I think that it is really possible and actually there was a rise in the sea levels in ocean and sea levels of about 120 meters so it is very very large let's say that plenty of our cities today are located nearby the coast so if the water rose, let's say, let's say 60 meters during a hundred years, maybe mm -hmm. it was that intensive, it would be really catastrophic. And that's why I think there could have been lost civilization. And I think that it is, I've, I've actually pointed to the possibility. And if we find more evidence, then we can confirm it. But it, there is a possibility of those lost civilizations, lost islands, lost lands, etc. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, uh, look, you know, what the climate change um, kind of uh, people who are alar uh, concerned about climate change, and I mean, well, we should be, but uh, the, the people who are talking about that um, are primarily, uh, you know, they're one of the big concerns is the rising sea level. Um, so it's if, if we don't change uh, our habits, and our behaviors, uh, they're saying that uh, we are going to see, um, we're going to lose all kinds of uh, land to the oceans as they rise. So we're going to lose Vancouver, uh, Los Angeles, Seattle, um, like every city in California, New York, uh, probably most of New England, um, a, a huge amounts of cities in Europe, uh, such as London, probably Paris, because it's you know, pretty low, um, all of the Netherlands. Lots of air, lots of land in Germany and in other places, uh, as well as all around the Mediterranean and uh, the Middle East, because it, like all uh, all of those cities are are very close to the ocean. Um, so, in effect, uh, depending on the speed and how how quickly we were able to respond, which so far is like we're not responding at all. Um, so we. You know, depending on if we decide suddenly, hey, we got to start making cities uh, in the mountains instead, well, that's going to be a, a major change in how we do things. Um, and uh, even if we did do that, it will change civilization. So civilization as we know it right now will see, cease to exist. Uh, certain parts of it are absolutely will because fishing will be gone um and you know many of the the things that we rely on for our current civilization have a lot to do with our geography and we like to think that uh it doesn't matter we're above all that you know we're so smart we can just make it work well i'm not so sure um and uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all if we had a kind of a post-apocalyptic scenario playing out simply because the ocean is rising. Um, so it, but it wouldn't be the first time because we know for a fact that that's already happened. Um, and how much of what was, was here previously is now under the ocean. Um, I would argue that uh, possibly 100%. 
um, but certainly 90%. Um, so yeah, I think one of the one of the things that we should be looking at in terms of history and archaeology is exploring these underwater zones. Um, Doggerland is a huge area in between England and Germany, where, where is now the North Sea and the English Channel. Um, and we know for a fact that there were that there was civilization there. Um, the area around the Philippines and Indonesia is probably the largest area uh, consecutive land that was um, engulfed by water. And the, the amount of land there is just mind blowing. Um, and yet there doesn't really seem to be uh, very much of a focus in, in examining these mm -hmm. places, um, which yes. is sort of strange. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think it is hard to explore such deep parts, especially in the ocean. But as you maybe know, if you mention Graham Hancock, Graham Hancock actually made plenty of discoveries when it comes to what is underneath uh, the water, underneath seas and oceans. And he found that there are plenty of, let's say, ruins. Sometimes they are not officially accepted as ruins, like on the south eastern coast of india there are some ruins or some pieces that look uh, that look like some ruins or some like walls that can be dated to the end of the last ice age we've got for instance nearby malta some of the megaliths that are underneath the water and they could be maybe not from the end of the last ice age by may but maybe uh, from some few thousand years before uh, first civilizations mm -hmm. the similar thing happens for instance nearby Azores and nearby the coast of Portugal which is a great location when it comes to the Atlantis the hypothetical Atlantis that it could uh, have been there actually the same when it comes to Bahamas etc there is still uh, the uh, arguing about the Bimini road uh, there are the Yonaguni and I think that there are plenty of things that are hidden beneath the waters for instance lately there was the Heracopolis or something, some city was found uh, underneath the water from ancient Egypt, from dynastic Egypt. So it mm. wasn't like tens of thousands of years ago. So as you see, it can happen really quickly and uh, maybe plenty of things to discover uh, beneath the water levels. And actually, you know, even these estimations about the end of, of the last ice, ice age are only estimations. And there could, there could have happened plenty of other things, even more massive floodings, etc. I think. Sure. Well, one thing that, that I haven't really heard uh, anybody talking about is the Mediterranean Sea. Um, mm -hmm. Apparently, under the Mediterranean Sea, there are uh, there have been found over 200 sunken cities, as they're called. But I don't like the idea that the, really the name sunken city, because that implies that there was a city and the, the land lowered. Well, that's probably not the case, although that mm -hmm. can happen here and there. Um, uh, but if we've found 200 cities in what is now uh, the basically an ocean, um, that to me implies that uh, there was once dry land there. Um, mm -hmm. It's also uh, like there are other scientists more on the ge geography, geology side of it, um, who, are, who have studied the long-term um, history of the Mediterranean Sea and it's known that the the Mediterranean Sea did in fact dry up and became mm -hmm. a desert. Um, however, that was like five million years ago, so it doesn't really work with the timelines that we're looking at, uh, unless maybe there was uh, maybe there was actual intelligent humans five million years ago. Mm -hmm. I can't rule that out, um, especially if they were concentrated in what is now underwater. Maybe mm -hmm. the Mediterranean was like the main place where all of these guys were. And when it flooded catastrophically, uh, and it seems to have happened in a, in a extremely rapid uh, period of a couple of weeks to fill 
what is this huge, massive uh, ocean um, and the amount of water that, that came pouring through from the Atlantic uh, through what is now the Straits of Gibraltar, um, there's, uh, there's geological evidence that the, the amount of water coming through there was just like mind-blowingly uh, this just huge, huge torrential pouring from the Atlantic into the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it happened in, in a couple of weeks. So that really makes you wonder, mm -hmm. you know, what, what would that have been like to try to get out of that area? Um, mm -hmm. you know, with, with possibly millions of other people, uh, you know, fighting for transportation routes and whatnot. Um, another idea that I wanted to run by you, I guess, was what about, uh, you know, we know that the ocean levels rose, um, significantly after the, uh, after a lot of ice was melting. Um, but I wonder what we might find if we start thinking about the flood, uh, slightly differently because, mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking that, uh, prior to 10,000 or 12,000 years ago, there was a lot of ice um, mm -hmm. that we were in the middle of, I mean, we're still in the ice age, but the ice age was way worse uh, 12,000 years ago. And so I've seen um, some things that make me wonder if perhaps the flood story was actually a story about impending glacial uh, an impending ice age. And the, uh, so when you have the, usually there's a God character warning a hero um, to, to take shelter somewhere. When you look at um, in, these underground cities in Turkey, uh, such as Darren Kuyu, and there's mm -hmm. actually several others. In fact, there's hundreds of uh, kilometers of, of adjoining passageways all underground with these underground cities that each city um, can, can hold uh, is it 5,000 or 20,000? I can't remember. Lots of people, yes. Yeah, a lot of people could live there and, and did live there uh, because somebody had to have been there to, to make them in the first place. Um, nobody has been able to, tra to track their, uh, their dates at all They're in terms of when those were uh, dug out, but they were definitely man-made. Um, and that makes me think that perhaps some of these were created uh, during or at the beginning of the Ice mm -hmm. Age in order to take shelter from the coming ice. Um, and I think that that could be interpreted, some of the flood stories could be interpreted that way, uh, because when you think about it, what is ice um, but water, right? It's just water that happens to be cold. And most of the myths or legends, if you want to call them that, um, are from these areas where nowadays those these areas are basically deserts and they're hot and arid. And uh, if they had gotten from their ancestors the story of, uh, of, of, uh, of an ice age, how would they even understand that? Because they've never seen snow. So it's, it's possible, in my opinion, that some of those uh, some of these stories are maybe so old that they're actually talking about ice and uh, that was sort of lost in translation and turned into uh, a flood. Mm -hmm. Something yes. to think about. Yes, mm -hmm. I found some references in especially the flood myths that may point uh, to the smelting of the glaciers. And it's very interesting because it may point to these really catastrophic events of this younger driest period of this end of the last ice age. And I found even myths pointing to the melting of the glaciers from three uh, different parts of the world. From India, uh, from the Iroquois, Iroquois in Poland. Yeah. Right? Okay. Uh, and uh, the Scandinavia and the Iricus, the Native Americans uh, tell us that there was a huge frog that was having inside of it plenty of water and at one time 
the sun was actually actually melted this frog and it's literally that the sun rays actually destroyed this frog and from this frog all of the waters were coming and the flood came so i think that this is a great metaphor of these glaciers like a frog which has mm -hmm. all of the water inside we've got the sun that melts this glacier and all of the waters came out of this frog uh, the same is for instance in india we've got that there was a dragon vritra who was also having i don't know if it was water or blood but actually indra Indra got his arrow in flame and from this flaming arrow shot at Vritra at this dragon and also from this dragon there appeared the flood because uh, he contained this dragon plenty of blood or water. So again, I think that it is very possible that some, let's say, cosmic event, was it a solar flare, was it an asteroid or some comet right. and it melted the glaciers. The same was, I think, in the Ragnarok or altogether in the Nordic mythology. We've got Ymir, the, gi the frozen giant, the ice giant. So ice giant, again, like a glacier. Yeah. And this giant, this ice giant, this frozen giant was killed by some gods. And after it was killed, also the great flood appeared and the gods were saving themselves on boats. So we've got three different stories from different regions, one from Europe, one from India and one from North America that point to something like melting of the glaciers. Also in the Atrahasis story of flood, we've got mentions that uh, before the flood, actually a moment before the flood the earth rambled trembled like a bell and actually the same the same description I found in geological uh, book I think in the cataclysm 9600 BC uh, which was totally another context but it actually described the end of the uh, last ice age and as uh, these glaciers were melting and as large parts of the glaciers were being cut off and being thrown into the water uh, the earth really resounded like a bell so we've got actually some of the information that may point to the end of the last ice age that caused the great flood right well a lot of that kind of sounds like um does sound like an asteroid impact of some mm -hmm. kind um now yes. couple that with the fact that uh and this is some stuff that i talk about in my uh recent book fermi's paradox is bullshit mm -hmm. and um i talk about how asteroids contain a lot of water and mm. in fact, all of the water that we have here on Earth uh, has come from space. Um, mm -hmm. This is now basically a scientifically proven fact. Uh, we know that there was no water on Earth uh, at the beginning of Earth uh, because it was very hot as the, mm -hmm. as the rocks were condensing and it uh, steamed off. Um, so essentially, if there, were, if there was a comet impact and that comet uh, contain substantial amounts of water, mm -hmm. you would see uh, kind of a combination of things happening yes. where the, the impact itself would really ring the earth like a bell. Mm -hmm. um, yes. It would, it would, the comet would melt and suddenly add a lot of water. Uh, plus um, there are various mechanisms by which th such an impact would greatly affect the temperatures and then could lead to uh again this rapid melting of of the ice caps so mm -hmm. um yeah that is very interesting um so we do know that uh you know from from the ice records um it seems that the 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 sea levels rose uh by 400 feet or 150 meters um however it's possible that some of that was not even recorded in the ice records mm -hmm, because it may have been coming from external sources as well mm -hmm. uh, so it's possible that that sea that that ocean sea level rise was actually a lot bigger than 150 meters mm -hmm, of course 
Yes, um, there is a possibility like that. And I think that even speaking about geology and all of the advancements that we've got, we cannot say for sure, was it 120 meters, 150 or 200? And I think that still geology is very speculative, apart despite from all of the advancements that we still cannot tell anyone that it is a fact and that it is for sure. We need to dig really deeper still. Yeah, well, all we can do is look at evidence and mm -hmm. all we can really rely on is patterns that we have uh, that we are able to measure. Um, but uh, you're right. I mean, patterns are um, relying on rates and rates can change uh, for various reasons. Um, it's interesting, though, uh, I'll, I just do want to bring up Robert Schock. Uh, because of his work around dating the Sphinx, or specifically the the rock enclosure around the Sphinx. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, it was an outstanding idea at first, that he dated it either to 6,000 years BC or even further than that, to 8,000 years BC, 9,000 years BC. There are some different dates, because in geology we cannot speak for certain, but it was a very outstanding idea and even crazy for Egyptologists who thought that the beginning of the Egyptian civilization began, as we've mentioned, 3,100 years BC, and now we've got almost let's say 3,000 years more of this history. But then, as we've mentioned, the Gobekli Tepe was discovered and we've got the megalithic constructions from 9 to 10,000 years BC. So now this theory of water erosion around the Sphinx isn't that outstanding. And it is for sure that during the pharaonic times during which Sphinx was supposedly built, there weren't, there wasn't enough raining to cause this water erosion. But there are plenty of alternatives. For instance, mainstream critics thought of this enclosure around the Sphinx as being a large pool. And maybe if it was a pool, but you know, why they should store their water, we don't know. There could be those, there could be this water erosion. So it is still, it is still a theory. We have to, we need to have more evidence in my opinion, but it is very okay. interesting. Yeah. Okay. So I guess to wrap things up, um, we know that uh, people have been around for 200,000 years, and that's a conservative estimate. Um, you know, mm -hmm, yes. I've talked to many people who would push that back a lot farther. Mm -hmm. um, 400,000, for instance. Yeah, even into the millions. Um, and there is there is evidence for it. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying that the evidence yes, yes. is, uh, you know, substantial or whatever, but there's some evidence. Mm -hmm. um, yes. But anyway, conservatively speaking, we've been mm -hmm. here for 200,000 years and uh, people like to do stuff. People are active. People have ideas. People want to get out there and build shit and get things done. And I, I think that that has always been the case. Um, that is not something new. Uh, we've mm -hmm. always been explorers, which explains our evolutionary successes is, is that we, you know, we've depended on these attributes uh, in order to get where we have. And these are not recent developments. So I think you're correct in saying that uh, it seems odd that there is this vast discrepancy be between when we could have been able to do stuff and when we know about the stuff that we have done. Um, so to me, that does imply that there's a lot of things that we've done that we uh, are not giving uh, our ancestors credit for. Um, we do know that uh, 10,000 years ago, um, a lot of people were, were telling the same story. Um, and so it seems like it's not a story that they made up. Uh, it seems evidence-based because we're hearing the same story uh, from our ancestors around the globe that there was some kind of uh, catastrophe involving the melt melting of ice and uh, and the rising of the, of the sea, which has now been scientifically validated mm -hmm. and we have the data to back it back up their stories. So we know they were telling the truth uh, and we know that they were talking about a real event. 
Um, so to me, if there were people uh, telling these histories, because let's let's call it what it is. These are historical events that mm -hmm. happened uh, and people are talking about them. So what, what they're doing is they're telling history. And so if we've had histories that are scientifically proven uh, going back 10 and 12,000 years, um, then to me that says we were civilized. We had mm -hmm. history. Of course. Well, history is one of the things you need. We also had art and mm -hmm. art goes back way farther in yes, into the yes. archaeological record uh, mm -hmm. into the 50,000 easily um, and and perhaps earlier so there were highly intelligent people who were our ancestors uh, you know in the distant past and during the during the peak of the ice age um, who were able to uh, to create histories or to to tell histories and not only that but to pass them along um, and to in, in essentially that means that there was education systems in play mm -hmm. um, and somewhere along the way we we have forgotten that those are true histories and and that they entail mm -hmm. education we've forgotten it uh, but we're not the only ones and there's plenty of other people around today who are still treating those uh, as their Aboriginal heritage, uh, as, as what they are. They are known to be uh, accurate histor histories and accounts of things that have actually happened. Um, so yeah, I, I, this has been a really great conversation. Uh, thanks for joining us, Alexander. And uh, I wish you well on your further books. Um, uh, maybe just show uh, show us your book again, or actually, I can I can put mm -hmm. the uh, picture up on the yes, here the it editing. is. Okay, oh. oh. yeah. And where can we find your book? Uh, only on the Amazon, but in plenty of different regions around the world. But on the Amazon, it is available in soft cover and in Kindle. Excellent. Okay. Uh, well, hopefully, um, our uh, some of our viewers will uh, check that out. And I know I will. I've, I've already got my copy and I'm planning on reading it a couple more times and getting out my highlighter and dog earing some of those pages because there is a lot of uh, really fantastic information in there. Thank you once again, Alexander. And, yes, uh, I also will... thank you for having me on. You bet. Okay, we'll talk to you later.